Hello, I am Michael Collins and this is Media Focus. In today's video, we are going to be looking at Ubisoft. Ubisoft are the publisher and the developer of the Assassin's Creed series. They are an absolutely vast, major media organization who produce a number of AAA or extremely expensive video games in a range of different genres. We are going to be going through a very, very brief history of the company, nothing too, too special or anything like that. And if you do want to find more information on this, I do absolutely recommend that you do some research and that you investigate what kinds of games they make. More importantly, however, we are going to be applying two separate theoretical frameworks to Ubisoft. We are going to be looking at the work of David Hesman Hull and his investigation of the cultural industries. And we are also going to be looking at the criticisms that Curran and Seaton make of the media industries. And this idea that media industries are primarily focused on power and profit and the issues with this. Um, so yeah, let's get cracking. So first of all, just a quick introduction and a quick think about David Hesman Hull. So David Hesman Hull's big idea is about these ideas of the cultural industries. And what he means by this is quite simply the industries of culture, of media, of stories, of ideas and how these ideas are financed and how these ideas are financialized as well and turned into money making businesses. So first of all, the most important thing to realize about David Hesman Hull is this very, very first point here. Media industries seek to minimize risk and to maximize profit. Now, probably the very first thing that we learned in media studies, apart from, hello, my name is Michael and stuff like that, um, was this idea that every media product exists to make money. There is essentially no other reason for media products to exist beyond making money. Now, obviously, that's kind of nonsense in a lot of ways. Media products exist to be interesting, to entice audiences, and to create wonderful experiences that we can all share. However, that's kind of by the by. Media products in general are extremely expensive to make. They require a target audience who will definitely buy the product. And in order for this to happen, a lot of research, a lot of planning, um, and a lot of cynicism needs to go into this process. So what we've seen time and time again are media products which, no matter what their budget, have to target an audience and they have to do so in the most risk-free way imaginable. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to this rule. For example, the film I, Daniel Blake, which is low budget and targeting a comparatively very small audience, uh, does things slightly differently. That's a risky film which didn't make a whole lot of money, although it was very, very successful for an independent film. Um, we also have looked at the magazine Adbusters, which has a completely anti-capitalist ideology and frankly doesn't give a fig about exactly how much money it makes and is a not-for-profit organization. However, these are two exceptions which only really prove the rule. The vast majority of media products exist to make profit and the way in which they do this is by doing things in the least risky way possible. David Hesman Hull also discussed this idea of vertical, horizontal, and also multimedia integration. So it'll be worthwhile just going into that just very briefly. Vertical integration is the idea of a media organization owning different parts of the mode of production. A really good example of this would be a cinema, uh, a film production company like uh, Paramount. Now, Paramount not only own their studios, they not only own the rights to their films, uh, and in some cases they also have rights to certain directors and actors as well, uh, but Paramount also own the means of distribution. They own showcase cinemas, which are especially popular in America, um, and this is a form of vertical integration. So they make the films, they also own the means of the films being distributed as well. So these different sectors of the organization. And if you can imagine exactly what I'm doing with my hands right now, I'm doing a little ladder. I'm climbing up a ladder. We've got the different stages of this. And this goes all the way down to the bottom in terms of digital distribution, DVDs and stuff like that. We also have this idea of horizontal integration. Now imagine I'm holding my hand out horizontally 
like the sea. And horizontal integration is this idea of one organization owning other organizations which are in the same sector. So if a film company owns other film companies within the same sector, this is horizontal integration. And an excellent example of horizontal integration would be Disney. Disney also own a number of other film studios, for example, Lucasfilm and Marvel Studios. And they have acquired them by chucking absolutely massive amounts of money at them. Why? In order to corner the market and in order to obtain what we call a monopoly, i.e. owning everything in the same sector. So if you think about the board game Monopoly, you can only really win at Monopoly by getting everything on the same street and your rents go right up and you start to crush everybody else through your absolutely massive financial advantage. If you own everything in a sector, then that is the best thing possible possible for an industry, although there are many, many ethical issues with this as well. So this is vertical and horizontal integration. There's also another one which is multimedia integration, and this is the idea of using digital technologies in order to combine previously separate industries. So for example, uh, using the internet, using streaming services such as Netflix and stuff like that. Netflix is an absolutely excellent example of multimedia integration. Although to be quite honest, this is very similar to vertical and horizontal integration. It's also really, really worth pointing out right now that many organizations, including the one we're looking at today, Ubisoft, are both vertical and horizontal. And increasingly, as we start to see less diversity in the media industries, which is caused by essentially media organizations buying each other, um, we are starting to see more and more examples of both vertically and horizontally organized um, and integrated media conglomerates. So what we're going to think about is how to apply these two concepts, the structure of media industries, vertical and horizontal, and the idea of industries minimizing risk and maximizing profit. And we're going to try and apply this to Ubisoft, which is the name of the company which publish and produce the Assassin's Creed series. So first of all, just some key facts, nothing special. I found this on Wikipedia and you can do exactly the same. And I really, really, you know, ask that you do so. Ubisoft are absolutely huge. Here's a fact that you can just watch right there in the exam. They are the fourth largest publicly traded game company in America and in Europe. That is absolutely vast. Now, there exist a number of different markets in the video game industry. However, the Americas, that's North and South America. South America is actually, you know, a fairly large um, uh, consumer of video games. Um, and Europe is obviously vast as well. Uh, maybe they don't have so much of a foothold in Japan, but Japan have always traditionally done things differently, uh, which is why on my History of the Video Game uh, Industry lecture video thing, uh, I really made this big distinguishing between Japan and the rest of the world. Ubisoft are a French company. They were established in France in 1986, and their main base is in a city called Montreux. I hope I pronounced that right, in France. Um, although they also have divisions across the world. Ubisoft are therefore an example of a multinational, transnational multimedia corporation. So established in 1986, although it did take a little while for them to get going, they had a significant amount of money behind them already when they started. You can check that out by reading them up on Wikipedia. Um, and yeah, so now they're totally multinational. They are also, as I've mentioned before, both horizontally and vertically integrated. They are a media conglomerate. What's a conglomerate? Well, a conglomerate is where a company buys out other companies and they kind of glom onto one another into some huge blob. And Ubisoft are a particularly large blob. They own a number of studios and they have a number of subsidiaries. A subsidiary is a company which works under another company. And Ubisoft owns so many of them, I'm not even going to go into it. But again, go on Wikipedia and just check out their subsidiaries. And I'll just point out in the exam, they own a number of subsidiaries. This makes them very, very much horizontally integrated. But also we're going to see they're very much vertically integrated as well. Ubisoft's USP or unique selling point, such as it is, is they make big 
games. They are huge, and their games are similarly huge. So, one key term we can use for the video game industry is this idea of triple A games. Triple A games are the video game equivalent of blockbusters. They are huge. They have huge budgets. They require thousands of people to work on them. They have very high production values, and they expect and demand and really need to get huge sales in order to cover their apps absolutely enormous production costs. Ubisoft publish and develop a wide range of games in different genres. However, despite the fact there is some diversity in the amount of games that they put out, in general their games target pretty vast mainstream audiences, although there are some big differences between the audiences that they target in different games, as we're about to see. So let's just take a little look at some of the games that Ubisoft have put out. So this is directly from their website. This is just clicking on the games tab. Um, and we can see that there is a real diversity in what we can see there. So first of all, we have Assassin's Creed, as we can just see on the bottom center there. And Assassin's Creed is one of Ubisoft's, if not Ubisoft's biggest franchise at the moment. It is a huge franchise, which targets predominantly teenage boys. Um, although obviously it does have secondary audiences as well. Um, above that, we see the the franchise Watch Dogs, which is targeting a much older audience. It's a gritty and violent crime-based game, um, and its direct competition would be something along the lines of Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto series. On the bottom right, we see the Just Dance series. The Just Dance series is a series of dancing games, which is especially important and popular with a family audience. So again, very, very different from what we see in Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs, which demonstrates the diversity of Ubisoft's output. However, once more, I've got to point out that the thing that does link these is they're all aiming for and they all get vast audiences. And Just Dance is one of, well, we'll go into it in a second. They also publish a number of what is sometimes known in the industry as being casual games. Okay, so this is a slightly derogatory term sometimes, but games like Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, uh, stuff like that, um, tend to target a less hardcore video game audience. So the kind of people who probably wouldn't even really say that they play video games, but then they'll pull out something like Candy Crush or something like that. They also own other franchises which were initially developed up by other people, including the Might and Magic series, which has been going on since the 1980s. They own the rights to that. And as we can see here, they have published a number of spin-offs from this. So Might and Magic, Chess Royale. So Ubisoft are absolutely huge. So why does Ubisoft publish such a wide range of video games? Why don't they just focus on one thing? Why don't they just do it really, really well? Well, the answer is very, very simple. It is in order to minimize risk and to maximize profit. Let's just say the Assassin's Creed series goes down the pan. Now, obviously, that's going to be a huge issue for Ubisoft and their shareholders. However, they have a number of other franchises which exist. For example, Just Dance uh, and... Uh, uh, kind of board game, fun game, casual games like Wheel of Fortune, which allow them to target a multitude of different audiences. So they do so in order to minimize risk. Ubisoft are not a risky venture. Okay. And if I had any clue how the stock market worked, I would probably buy some shares in them. Can I even do that? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm not a business studies teacher. And this in turn helps them to maximize their profit. So one of the most famous video games that Ubisoft had put out, and probably the game that really put them on the map, was this game Rayman, which came out in 1995, something like that. Um, and this is a colourful character-based platformer, which was released on the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn and a number of other 32-bit consoles in the mid-90s. Rayman was a very, very straightforward platform game. And when I say platform, it's a side-on view. You control a little character and you jump on a load of platforms. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Think Mario. Um, and we can see a screenshot of the very first Rayman game here. Rayman's USP was that it had very high production values for a 
D platformer. Generally, these games are quick and simple and easy to shovel out, and they have a uh, a kind of reputation for being often absolutely terrible. However, Rayman, although nothing special, is nice and colourful, and the character got on really well, and this really helped Ubisoft to kind of reach to the heights that they are now. As pointing out before, they have a very diverse output, and one of their most successful franchises is the D Just Dance franchise. This is a family-friendly game which has come out on a range of different consoles. It does particularly well on Nintendo consoles, such as the Wii and the Switch, um, which traditionally have a more family-centric audience share. One of the USPs of Just Dance is there is a range of different music of different genres, although it does tend to focus on pop. Um, and again, the USP is you do not need to be good at video games in order to play this. You just need to dance in front of your telly to move around roughly in time to the music and you get points and it's all very colourful and it's fun. Okay, so this is an example of what we might call a casual game or a family game. And again, there's a huge range of music from Western pop to Korean pop as well, which helps Ubisoft to target a range of different markets around the world. And different versions of Just Dance released around the world will have different track listings in order to, to target what we call regional markets. So we've seen here uh, many examples of diversification. And diversification is a media practice where an organization will seek to produce a diverse or different range of media products, which helps them to target a range of different audiences. Now, this is obviously very, very good sense for a media industry. However, Ubisoft have actually diversified beyond video games as well. And there's not actually a whole lot of companies which have done this, um, but... One of the other biggest ventures is Ubisoft Motion Pictures. Um, and probably the most famous film was the live action Assassin's Creed film, which was released a number of years ago. Now, I hear it's absolutely unwatchably terrible, and I can't really imagine it being my kind of thing, but you know, never mind. This was a minor success. It's also an example of vertical integration. So this idea is that not only do Ubisoft own things within the same industry, but they also own different modes of production um, in different industries as well. So by using the same franchise, which they already have the rights to, they can release it in a completely different format. And the cool thing about the Assassin's Creed film is that it can target audiences who would not normally be targeted by video games, which then allows them to diversify their output and to reach different audiences. So even though this might seem pretty risky, you know, let's make a film. Well, that's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, and obviously a big financial investment as well. The fact is that this is what is known as a pre-sold audience. There already exists fans of the Assassin's Creed series. Now, video game adaptations, film adaptations of video games have a long and checkered history with a reputation of being generally absolutely awful. And in fact, the Assassin's Creed film is actually, from what I hear, actually on the good end of the video game spectrum. But it doesn't really matter if they're any good or not. Video game adaptations can lead huge audiences into the cinema. And if we add to that people who are just generally in interested in fantasy and historical action films, then this allows Ubisoft to target audiences which they would not be able to target previously. Now, this now leads us on to some criticism of Ubisoft and their practices. So let's take a look at what I've dubbed as key theory number 12. Uh, if this numbering system doesn't work for you, just forget about it. This is just for me. Um, power and the media industries. And this is Curran and Seton. And they are most famous for their book, Power Without Responsibility, which looks at news media primarily in the UK. And this idea of pursuing power and profit over everything else. So let's just run through Curran and Seton's ideas here very quickly. One. The media is controlled by a small number of companies, and they are primarily driven by power and profit. Now, this is a cool fact to chuck in 
any time you want to make a statement in the exam because it's nice and straightforward. And it applies to basically everything which isn't ad busters. Every organization we've looked at is driven by power and profit. Now, how is it that a media product can become profitable? Well, it needs to target the largest audience possible. And for Karen and Seaton, this is bad news. Because for Karen and Seaton, media concentration limits variety, creativity, and quality. What do they mean by media concentration? Well, have a think about how huge Ubisoft are. And now think how small I am. Let's just say I want to start my own video game company and I want to make something like Assassin's Creed. How do I even start with that? The answer is I can't really. I need to compete on completely different terms. If I was going to make a video game, it would be an absolutely tiny independent video game, which would exist in a completely different world. And for Curran and Seaton, this is a good thing. Curran and Seaton argue that we need diverse patterns of ownership, that we need lots and lots of different sectors of the industry, and that, for example, independent video games play an extremely important role in media production. So, media concentration limits variety, creativity, and quality. If Ubisoft essentially owns so many subsidiaries and they have so much money and they are solely driven by profit and not through creating wonderful art, then this is totally going to limit creativity. And we can see this through Ubisoft's output. Now, while we have seen some diversification in their output, all of it is targeting a mass audience, and all of it is essentially out there to make a profit over everything else. Just Dance is not a risk. Uh, Might and Magic Chess is not a risk. Watch Dogs is not a risk, and Assassin's Creed is definitely not a risk. So, by focusing on mainstream big budget development, Ubisoft arguably offer a standardized and generic project product. And generic means it's kind of like the same. It's all the same. It's just exactly the same as everything else. And if we want to see exactly how generic Ubisoft output is, we need to look no further than the Assassin's Creed series, which is uh, like 21 Assassin's Creed games in the last 13 years. And there have been several years where there have been more than one Assassin's Creed game coming out. In 2014, we had Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, Assassin's Creed Rogue, Assassin's Creed U uh Identity, Assassin's Creed Unity, and Assassin's Creed Chronicles China released, which is what we could argue is this example of saturation. Where essentially Ubisoft have released so many games that they've saturated or completely drenched the market. And this also demonstrates this complete lack of creativity. Why is it that Ubisoft have released so many Assassin's Creed games? Well, the answer is because they sell. And if we think back to the preview, one of the previous videos where I showed you the front covers of Assassin's Creed games, they're all the same. And hardcore gamers can argue, well, yeah, you know, you get to go to France in this one, or you, you know, you, you get to climb like some huge tower in Germany or something like that. You know, these are very, very small differences when it comes down to it. This is the same game being released over and over and over again, with very, very little to differentiate between them. So I just want to read this whole bit out because I think it's really, really important. And actually it shows Ubisoft kind of in some degree kind of correcting their ways. Um, so, and we thought, you know, if we think five Assassin's Creed games were released in 2015, well, what does that actually do to the market? So this is directly from Wikipedia. So I'll make absolutely no apology to that. Wikipedia is great. Go for it. Citation Wikipedia. So, ongoing developments 2018 onwards. Since 2018, Ubisoft Studios have continued to focus on its core franchises, including Assassin's Creed, Tom Clancy's, Far Cry, and Watch Dogs, but found itself starting to trail its rival publishers, Electronic Arts, Activision, and Take Two. As reported by Bloomberg Businessweek, while Ubisoft as a whole had nearly 16,000 developers by mid-19, larger than some of its competitors and producing five to six major AAA releases each year compared to the two or three from the others, the net revenue, i.e. the money, earned per employee was the lowest of the four due to generally lower sales of its games. 
Bloomberg Business attributed this partially due to the spending trends by video game consumers purchasing fewer games with long play times, as most of Ubisoft's major releases tend to be. To counter this, Ubisoft in October 2019 published three of the six titles it planned in 2019 to 20 or later as to help place more effort on improving the quality of the existing and released games. Further, due to overall week sales in 2019, Ubisoft stated in January 2020 that it will be reorganizing its editorial board to provide more comprehensive look at its game portfolio and devise more variation in its games, which Ubisoft's management said had fallen stagnant and too uniform and contributed to weak sales. So when something is stagnant, it gets old and smelly. So stagnant water, if you leave a cup of water out for a couple of weeks, it will go all gross. And this is exactly what has happened to Ubisoft in recent years. They have essentially flogged the same horse over and over again. And this has had issues on their ability to essentially make more money than their competitors. So to Ubisoft's credit, they have stripped back their publishing of games and they have focused instead on less games per year in order to allow consumers to really really kind of you know focus on the few excellent games and also to combine their resources as well so yeah let's just take a look finally at a couple of issues with this idea of aggressive conglomerization so this idea of ubisoft essentially pushing the boundaries in terms of how much money they can make this idea of limiting risk to such a degree that they have released 21 games in the same series in 13 years you know to put that into consideration there are some final fantasy games which have taken approximately 13 years to create um although it's not exactly you know only a few final fantasy games but never mind so one huge issue with aggressive conglomeration and with the lack of diversification in media practices is this idea that it limits creativity if you are solely making a game to make lots and lots of money, then there are only a few things that you can do with it. You cannot be creative. Now, some of my favorite games have made very, very, very little money compared to Ubisoft games. However, I would argue that even though they're weird and wacky and cheap, they are far more creative and interesting. And for my money, I would much, much rather play a game like Danganronpa or Killer7, which are absolutely bizarre yet completely original games than something like Assassin's Creed 21, which is essentially run around and collect stuff and stab people and go like that in a really, really deep voice. Was that good? I don't know. The microphone might not pick that up. So this idea that it limits creativity. Another huge issue is the one I mentioned earlier on, and this limits competition as well. Nobody can compete with Ubisoft unless you are Activision or Electronic Arts, i.e. other huge video game publishers and this is a huge issue with Ubisoft taking so much of the market in general people tend to play um, and this may not be an issue for you but people do tend to only play massive releases so if we consider someone who is only playing FIFA games and Assassin's Creed games, well, they are completely missing out on the wild, cool, wonderful world of video games which exist beyond these absolutely massive AAA games. So it limits competition. It reinforces this idea that in order to be successful, a video game has to have been in development for years and has to have cost millions and millions of pounds to complete. Finally, and this is very, very much linked to my last statement, um, one of the issues issues with aggressive conglomeration is that this limits diversity. So I know we said that Ubisoft are fairly diverse, and yet we could also argue that they're not. Each one of their games essentially only exists to target a huge audience. So you either pick massive game for teenage boys, Assassin's Creed, massive game for men in their 20s, i.e. Watch Dogs, or an absolutely massive game for the whole family, and that would be something along the lines of Just Dance. 
and these games essentially are not particularly creative they are not particularly competitive because they just smash out the competition and they are not diverse they are all exactly the same and i'm sorry if i said some incendiary things i'm sorry if you're a massive fan of the assassin's creed series and you've got all 21 and you can tell the difference between them um but i disagree with you i do not think that we have this diversity in this mainstream big budget video game creation so one of the things that we are going to be looking at in the future of this topic is we are going to be looking at some examples of independent video games and how they form in their own way, if not in terms of money, but maybe in terms of their output um, uh, and targeting a niche audience, how they might compete with Ubisoft in completely different ways. Thank you very much.